First World War, which started in 1914, was actually expected to happen long before. During that war, they had abused humanitarian law. They had abused the Red Cross flag. They had laid floating mines all over the oceans. They had bombarded cities. They had used war balloons. Well, in a way one can say that there has always been a need for peace conference and that has always been the ideal of humanists. The idea was very pertinent at the end of the 19th century because tension was building up, mostly because of the armaments race, which was just another corollary of the Industrial Revolution. And at the end of the 19th century it was said we must try and discuss these matters in a comprehensive way between all the so-called civilized nations of the world. But it all started in The Hague in 1899. So from 24 nations coming together in 1899 and 46 in 1907, it became 60 in 1920 with the League of Nations. From the beginning, the idea was that it was to be a sequel of conferences, a sequence. Never a single moment. They knew all along that these issues were too complicated to be solved overnight. The first conference was mainly on arbitration and the war on land. The second was war at sea. The great success of the first peace conference was to institutionalize the idea of arbitration. They came up with a first so-called permanent court of arbitration. And then they went in search for a building for this court of arbitration and the outcome was the peace palace where we are seated today. The Peace Palace itself is a really majestic building with great art and everywhere there are symbols of peace and justice. Andrew Carnegie was a businessman and his mission was to give his money to education, to peace and to science. Of course the Peace Palace fitted in his idea. William Stead was an important journalist from Britain. He reported on the conference, but also controversial issues or issues between nations. William Stead went to Andrew Carnegie to Scotland, where Carnegie had his uh, really big Skibo castle, to tell him and report him on the peace conferences. He told him also about the idea of making a peace palace, of opening a peace palace for uh, the housing of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Later on, Andrew White, that was an American delegate and a Russian delegate, the Martins, they also convinced him of this idea. So uh, he was convinced by these three men, by William Stead, by Andrew White and by the Martins, to give $1.5 million dollars uh, to the what he called the Temple of Peace in The Hague. He um, himself thought it was a really good idea to do something for mankind. When, with the help of Mr. Carnegie, in 1907, in the midst of the Second Hague Peace Conference, a stone-laying ceremony took place, the first stone of the Peace Palace, a French delegate came up with the idea, why can't we all, 46 nations all together, offer some help to the building of this temple of peace? And the nations accepted that idea. He said that it was really important for all the countries that the peace palace belonged to all nations. So it had to be an international palace. And that's why he asked all the countries to donate something. And it had to be the best national product 
of every nation. So it could be uh, marble, for instance, from Italy, because Italy is famous for its marble, or windows from uh, Great Britain, or uh, paintings from France. This room is called the Japanese Room because of the uh, beautiful wall tapestries hanging here. They are indeed a gift from Japan. The title is uh, 100 Birds and 100 Flowers in Late Spring and Early Summer, so it's really a poetic title. In this room we also uh, see the Turkish carpet. And it's, it's part of Asia, of course, uh, Turkey, to, for the location. So they said, okay, it belongs to this room. So it's a collection of international gifts, but it fits together in a beautiful way. Adalet Divanı kurulurken Osmanlı Devleti'nde oraya bir hediye verilmek düşünülüyor ve Sultan Reşat, Mehmet Reşat, o zamanki Osmanlı padişahı oraya bu halıyı özel dokutturarak büyük çaplı bir halıdır. Ya yani çok büyük salon halısı. Onu oraya özel olarak göndertiyor. Unik bir eser, tek bir eser ve bir daha kolay kolay bulunabilecek olan bir eser değil. Avrupa'nın uç kısmında, kuzey sayılabilecek olan bölümünde, Türkiye'ye uzak olan bir yerde Osmanlı Devleti o zamanki iletişim e, araçlarına rağmen oraya bir halı göndermek, bir halı hediye etmek, şarkın ve garbın, doğru ve batının bir işbirliğinin çok güzel bir örneği. The Turkish delegation of the Sublime Porte took a very interesting position. First of all, it was a very big delegation, eight men. The first delegate, Turk Pasha, was a wonderful diplomat. He was very learned, very literary educated. He had been foreign minister and he was very agile, elegant, gracious. And with his red fez, he was a striking appearance. So he was much admired by the ladies and much uh, uh, respected by his colleagues. And the same, to some extent, held good for the second delegate, Nora Bey. And there were three or four foremost delegates, so to speak. The correspondence of the Turkish carpet started in 1909. So there was a letter of the Ottoman Empire uh, saying that they would like to uh, donate a Hereke carpet. It was manufactured in the imperial factory in Hereke. We know that it was a really prestigious factory because these carpets were only given to friended nations or to statesmen. But it's also a man product. So a lot of people had to be in the process of designing it and manufacturing it. It was the best of the best. You see it in colors, beautiful patterns. It was, I believe, the best products given by Turkey. Halı Türklerin icat ettiği bir nesnedir. Yani dünyada halı üretimi, halı diye bir şey ilk bilinmezken Orta Asya'da Türkler tarafından icat edilmiş. Normal geleneksel Türk halıları daki düğüm sayısıyla hereke halılarının düğüm sayıları oldukça farklı. Hereke halılarının düğüm sayıları çok sıktır. Yani bir santimetre kareye atılan düğüm hesabıyla bunların kaliteleri ölçülüyor. Bir ipek halıda bir santimetre karede enine boyuna altı çarpı altı düğüm oluyor. Hereke'deki fabrika 1843 yılında kuruluyor. Hereke Fabrikayı Hümayunu Osmanlı Sarayı'na padişaha bağlı olarak ondan sonra ve bir kumaş üretim fabrikası olarak çalışıyor. Daha sonra 1891 yılında halı dokuma tezgahları ilave ediliyor ve bundan sonra halılar üretilmeye başlıyor. Sarayların tefrişi için gerekli olan malzemelerin üretimi burada yapılıyor. Yabancı devlet adamları işte ülkeye ziyarete gelin, geldiğinde e, bu herekeye götürülerek fabrika gezdirilmiş ve bunlara e, halılar hediye edilmiş. Kültür ve Turizm Bakanı Müsteşar olarak Hollanda'ya gittim. Adalet Divanı'nın büyük salonuna girer girmez halıyı gördüm. 
Sonra yanında olan bizim yani turizm işaretimiz vardı Orlando'daki. Adamın yıpranmış olduğunu fark ederek sordum. Dedi ki efendim burada çok gündemli olan bir konu. Bu eski tarihi bir alısı ve bunun bakımı, restorasyonu gerekiyordu. Hemen biz dedim talip olalım Türkiye olarak ve bu konuda yardımcı olalım. Öyle başladı. Sonra yetkililer geldi ve benim müzik müsteşarı dışında herkese olmam, halıyla ilgilenmem. Onlara çok hoşuna gitti ve onlarla böyle bir çalışmaya başladık. The room is used frequently. The carpet has a lot to endure the last century. So you see that there is a lot of damaged parts in the carpet. The Turkish government was here and they were really impressed by the carpet. They offered to restore the carpet in Turkey. I think that is a wonderful gesture. I hope it's going to uh, be as it was a century ago, because I'm convinced that the colors would look magnificent again. And after it returns, we have to take care of it and to conserve it. Bizim uzmanlar gelip benim ekspertiz yaptılar ve bunun tahminini ile bir yıl arasında süreceğini öngördüler, tahmin ettiler. Layihada divanın yetkilileri henüz kararı vermeler. This project of um, restoring the carpet in Turkey is not an easy project because the carpet is really large indeed and um, it has to be moved from The Hague to Turkey or by land or by air. So we have to figure out the best way in logistics and I think it's a project that needs uh, cooperation between the two countries and I hope it's going to succeed wonderfully but it's an it's a example of working together uh, and working together to to complete this uh, this wonderful project. Over the decades, so many meetings to promote peace and the rule of law have taken place here. But from the first, it was also meant to symbol peace on a global basis, bringing together all the traditions, Western and non-Western, and stand out as a symbol of the hope of man one day to achieve peace on a durable basis worldwide.